everyone, and welcome back to the science of saying and. Um, today I'm going to talk about something very anecdotal for me, um, and that is mental health and difficulties with mental illness. And I'm bringing this up because I think it's actually a really important topic to talk about and for there to be awareness of. Um, and for there to be no stigma about it, but I think in the world of performing and also in the world of research and academia, really in a lot of actually professional areas, especially in the United States, um, it's not very well respected if people have difficulties with mental illness, and it's also not very well understood. So, to that end, um, I will start this out by saying sorry, I had another like hiatus from doing recordings with the blog. Um, part of that is is busyness, and honestly, to to be totally honest, part of it is because I do have an issue with having chronic depression and anxiety. Those two things love to go together. They go together fairly commonly in a lot of people. Um, my chronic depression, I believe, is actually familial. Um, I believe there was a lot of undiagnosed depression in my family, and I also do have a family member who has severe major depressive episodes um, and who does struggle with chronic depression a great deal. So, um, but mine was pretty untreated and undiagnosed for a long time, but it's been diagnosed for a while. I've had a few years of counseling under my belt now, like me going to my own counselor there. Uh, and I'm also on medication daily, which has actually made a huge difference and has actually really helped. But I avoided going on it for a long time, and I'm going to get into why that is later on. But, um, yeah, so what that means is if I'm having a bit of a, of a, of a down spell with my depression, um, even with the medication, I can end up having very low motivation to do things that even though I would love to do it more... Um, Sometimes you just have to kind of go into like, I just need to get like the bare essentials done instead of getting other fun things like this blog, like recording stuff. Um, sometimes. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why motivation gets down. It doesn't help that depression likes to tell you like everything you do, do is worthless. So <laughs> that's probably the biggest uh, thing where it's like, oh, geez, you know. Um, so it's really hard to like put yourself out there, you know, and, uh, and, and, and do stuff like this, do like educational recordings and whatnot. If you have like these thoughts in your brain, basically saying like, you're an idiot. Why are you doing that? That's stupid. Um, and I'm not saying that for any sympathy, but for reals, that's like depression. Boom. Um, and I'm starting to figure out essentially, I think I've, after, since I've had treatment for a few years now, I'm still trying to learn and, and, and balance um, what it means to have this chronic condition, to have depression as like a constant, and, and, and learning what, uh, what medication allows me to do, but also learning the, you know, the, what it doesn't, what it doesn't prevent. You know, it doesn't prevent me from having uh, times where my depressive thoughts get somewhat intrusive. Um, it's not as bad as when I wasn't medicated. It's, I don't have major depressive episodes, knock on wood, uh, thus far anyway, <laughs> probably thanks to medication really. Um, but, you know, it means I do actually have to still use a lot of the tools I was given during counseling to just kind of get through my day, you know? Um, and that's really why I want to bring this up, because if you're a young performer, to the young singers out there, the young performers, and also to fellow academics, <sighs> doctoral students, PhD candidates, all you guys, <laughs> all right, these two worlds have a certain parallel. Performing and academia. Academia in the United States meaning essentially the university system and specifically research-based fields in the, in the university system where the bulk of the real scientific research is done. Same thing with um, the, the really pretty much any performance field in the United States. And if you've been following any of the Me Too movements uh, stuff, especially with huh, all the stuff that's been 
uh, going around in terms of sexual harassment and whatnot. Um, you know that there's a real big issue with an imbalance of power in the performing world for anyone who's up and coming, trying to make it, kind of trying to break in. Um, you're really at the mercy of the people who are in power. And <clears throat> that's the whole thing with the Me Too movement, right? Because people who are in power, if they are horrible uh, <laughs> and, and predata uh, predatory, they can totally um, take advantage of that power differential. And that exists in academia as well. Um, PhD students, although, and sometimes master's students, but I think more graduate students because they're around more often, undergrads to a certain extent, but at the same time, I think what happens with PhD students is, especially in any kind of science or anything like that um, in the United States, and, and probably in humanities too, but I don't know as much about those fields culturally um, at the doctoral level. But um, you're training directly with someone, you are um, talking with them, ideally, hopefully you see them some, but you're entering a field where the gatekeepers are people who've been in the field for a long time, they have tenure, maybe they have lots of money in grants, or maybe they have had lots of money in grants, um, maybe they have major awards, like international awards for the research they've done and all this sort of thing. Um, and so you don't want to displease those people. You don't really want to step a toe out of line because those reputation is essentially everything in academia. And when you are an unknown, it's really easy for the people with reputation to talk to the other people with reputations and say, yeah, this person sucks. Never, ever, ever hire them. Sound familiar? That actually sounds a lot like performance. Performance tends to have, and I mean performance in general, whether you're a singer, an actor, film, theater, dancer, doesn't really matter. All those different areas, all those different fields have that similar thing where it's like if you're the young one, you're the up and comer, um, something happens that's really bad and you want to tell someone about it, well now if the person in power tells their buddies, uh, no, blah, 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 she's really dramatic or whatever, you might not ever get hired. You might get kind of blacklisted, right, fairly early on. So in both of those fields, that is an extreme imbalance of power. There's really no one for you to go to, essentially. If you are put in a position where as the subordinate, as the person without power, <laughs> um, is in an unhealthy, to the point of toxic relationship, with someone in a position of power, um, if they're in a position of power, it's real in both of those fields. There's no human resource department for you to go to. There's no uh, like legal help for you to get. You don't have the money. You don't have the power. You got essentially nothing. And so a lot of times for subordinates, what they try to do is just get through the day, you know, or get through the situation and move on and not say anything. And a lot of times they think to themselves, hopefully I'll be in a position of power one day and then I can take these people down. Sometimes that happens, sometimes not, most of the times not. Um, but essentially, this is the culture, right? And obviously, if we're talking about harassment and stuff, you could be talking about PTSD, total traumatic experiences, Anytime you're in really a super highly toxic environment, you could end up with some form of PTSD from that, right? Anytime um, if, if the person in, 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 if the person uh, with power um, essentially is going to emotionally abuse their subordinates, um, yeah, that's pretty tra traumatizing for a lot of people. Um, <laughs> you know, and it, and it can really harm. Um, someone and it's interesting because I actually started seeing counselors um, at University of Arizona during my time there um, and like I said mine is chronic but you know I went through a little period of a little bit of trouble there and um, it was interesting to me because those counselors you know they're very attuned to what graduate students had to deal with because they saw a lot of graduate students because a lot of graduate students had not just depression and anxiety, but some of them would even have like what would seem like clinical paranoia, honestly. Like they seemed like, you know, they're worried that everyone's out to get them. And it's like, well, that's a that's kind of a valid fear though. And you know, when you're in a position where one 
toe out of line could mean no career for you, could mean you've wasted a few years of your life uh, and all this stuff, which is kind of sad, right? Um, but I don't have any solutions for that. I just want to let people know that that exists, that there is this complete imbalance of power that unfortunately as a subordinate, here's what I would say. Um, be very, I would recommend everyone anyway, to be very vigilant about their mental health and to prioritize their mental health. Um, and sometimes that might mean giving up a career, as awful as that is, or it might mean making choices that you know will make your career harder in the long run. You know it'll take you longer to get to where you want to go. Um, you might have to step away from a job or turn down something, and you might have to lie to do it. You might have to come up with like a politically okay reason to leave a situation if it's toxic, um, and then you know that's setting you back. That's setting you back maybe a few years. Who knows? And it's hard, and it sucks. <laughs> Not saying it doesn't. It sucks all around. But um, personally, as someone who really downplayed her own mental health for a very long time in her life, I have gotten to a point where I have made it a priority of mine to maintain decent mental health as much as I can. Um, and that means essentially walking away from opportunities that might be amazing, but might actually be toxic or that turn out to be toxic and just being done with it. And, um, you know, and it's, it's hard to say because you don't want a reputation for being flighty. You don't want a reputation as someone who just gives up when the going gets tough. Um, there's a lot of things you don't want, but for me, what's more important is, and the thing about having good mental health and really being vigilant about it and paying attention to it is, you know, you live with your mind all the time. You don't live with other people's opinions of you all the time. You don't live with your reputation technically all the time. And also reputations can be salvaged. They can, people can change, you know? Uh, they can be salvaged and it just takes a while, but just persistence can do it, right? It can salvage reputation. Um, it can, you know, if you're persistent enough and careful enough and make good choices, good selections, you can really show people what you're made out of in the long run and really just fish out those, uh, there, it's not, not everybody's toxic. So you can always fish out support from people who are not, uh, and lean on those people to help you out the most, right? I mean, never undervalue a mentor who's not toxic, <sighs> especially if they're in a position of power as well. Huh, yeah, use those people for sure. Go to them, let them be your mentor, let them, you know, help guide you through any difficult situation if you're in performing as well. Um, I would say, yeah, make sure you have an emotional support system of people who ideally professionally understand the stakes. Sometimes family are great, but sometimes they don't understand the stakes. Um, that you're up against. Sometimes they won't quite understand the emotional uh, confusion you could be feeling over feeling like there's a situation you need to leave, regardless of whether it's the most amazing opportunity ever, because you can look completely nuts, essentially, to people who are outside of your field if it looks like you're tossing away some amazing opportunity. And, you know, it would be lovely if you say, well, I gotta give this up because this is really bad for me. And, and my mental health is really suffering and I need to leave. That can look like you're giving up, like you're weak, like you're, you know, there's a lot of really mean things that can be said about that. Um, but I would say in the long run, making the choices to prioritize your own mental health and to prioritize, and I mean mental health, not just happiness. I'm not talking about, you know, if things get a little too hard or whatever. I'm talking like overall how you see the world, <laughs> you know, if you're running through your days with feeling dissociated, 
something I um, have a tendency to do when I'm having a depressive sort of state dissociated from like um, like I have no emotional reaction to things like you feel like you're kind of an observer to your life um and that was a lot worse before I'm actually on medication now I don't know if I said that oh yeah I did that's right um I think I did anyway <laughs> um so I had a lot worse when I was there so numbness emotional numbness um maybe constantly feeling like you have no motivation, feeling like you're living in a brain fog, like you can't concentrate, um, very little to no motivation to work, um, in addition to feeling sad, but essentially there's a lot of aspects, you know, or maybe you have a different, you know, you have more of a bipolar or something where you have these like super dips and then you also have these super highly like, super productive but manic kind of like you're up in the middle of the night doing a kabajillion things or maybe you stay up for like three days straight or something uh kind of thing <laughs> that's not the best either so yeah so i would say um we like to prioritize our physical health but i think we really do need to prioritize our mental health um a lot of times in the united states if you're at a college campus um there's probably a student health center that probably has a counseling center attached to it you might not always find the best counselors, but it's always worth a try um, because counseling can be very expensive to go to. Not all counselors take insurance, so even if you have insurance, it can be expensive um, in the United States. But yeah, getting some help is a good idea. Um, even if you're not sure if you have like an actual mental illness, if you're just concerned, like you feel really off, and you don't really feel like yourself anymore. Um, if you feel like you're in a situation where the stress has gotten so bad that you're just constantly worried or you're having insomnia or whatever it is, yeah, go see somebody, talk to them about it. See if they can give you some tools to help you cope um, and then help to give you perspective too. That's one of the best things I think about um, talking to a professional about it is getting a perspective of, you know, cause you might feel like you're crazy. <laughs> um, and then having someone say, no, your reactions are justified. That makes sense. Um, here's another way to look at it, though. And here's some decisions you can make. Here's what's still in your power to do. Um, that really helped me, having a counselor essentially say, like, you know, like one of the best things she told me is she's like, um, I had a really uncomfortable meeting at one point. <laughs> uh, one where I nearly had a panic attack. Like nearly, I'm sure to the people in the room, it looked like I did have a panic attack, except it wasn't a full on one. So I felt like, hey, it wasn't full on. We're okay. I did okay tamping it down, you know? And um, and it was a professional setting. And I was like, oh my gosh, an anxiety attack in a professional setting. Like I don't have, it's not so crippling that that tends to happen to me. So it was embarrassing and all this. And I go to my counselor and she's like, number one, you don't have to be embarrassed about having an anxiety attack. She's like, that's a thing that happened. You know, if they want you to feel embarrassed, that's their problem. You don't have to feel embarrassed. The other thing she said is, you know, you are, it's always your power to leave a room. You can leave if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel emotionally safe. You can just walk up and leave. You don't have to give them an explanation. You don't have to tell them, even if it's professional setting. You don't have to say, excuse me, I have to go. Or hold on a second and leave. You can literally just stand up and walk away. And I was like, oh, you know, cause you don't think that you have the power to do that. You think that sounds kind of dramatic or whatever. And she's like, you're doing it to help yourself. And if they want to know what was going on later, you don't have to tell them anything. I mean, you, you don't have to tell them anything, but you could just say, you know, I was not feeling emotionally safe or I was feeling, you know, yeah, like I needed a break from that situation. Like, you know, it's like you can just come up with something, rehearse something in your mind that you can say and just walk away and be done with it. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, so it's like having someone like that, having someone who's just like, this is in your power to change, you know? Um, it can be the tiniest of things you can change, but you can take the power back in certain situations and you can like say, yeah, I have a right to leave if I don't feel great. Yeah, if I don't feel safe. I think emotionally safe was a big thing for me. Um, and realizing if you don't feel emotionally safe, figuring out how to feel emotionally safe. 
And that might mean leaving a job. That might mean walking away from opportunity. It might mean saying, you know, if that person does it again, I'm going to leave. It might be giving yourself a certain date. You know, by this date, I will be having, I'll have other opportunities to, so I can walk away from this one. You know, whatever it is. Um, you know, or I will minimize my interaction with this person in these ways, perhaps. Who knows? Whatever. You can figure that out and you can see someone and talk to them about it. Um, the other thing, and I know this is kind of long, but the other thing I really want to encourage younger singers especially, being that I was a young singer with chronic depression, didn't re realize it, had some anxiety, also had some untreated PTSD um, related to some events um, in my childhood and teenage years. And, um, you know, dealing with all that stuff in your 20s, early 20s, as a performer, making no money, blah, 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 like, oy, oy, oy. Uh, <laughs> it's tough, man. And you get told a lot of things as a young performer that in retro, upon reflection anyway, hindsight's 2020, right? Upon reflection are not the healthiest messages if you have a mental illness. Like, if you don't, yeah, maybe these are okay messages. But the message of you need to have a thick skin. You don't have to have a thick skin. You need an emotional support system, but you don't have to have a thick skin. You need a way to deal with disappointment that's healthy. That's what you need. It's not unhealthy to feel disappointment, and it's not unhealthy to feel sad if you don't get your auditions. If you don't get jobs from your auditions or you don't get the roles or whatever, that's not unhealthy. Um, it would be more unhealthy to deny the disappointment you feel. Feel disappointment. You don't have to throw a fit, but you can feel your disappointment. You know, you can set aside your day to like sit and binge on TV shows and eat some ice cream or whatever the heck or drink, you know. Well, don't really self-medicate with alcohol. I wouldn't encourage that too much, but you know what I mean. <laughs> if it's the occasional, okay, I need to make sure, you know, oh, okay, casting sheet goes up probably this day. Let me call my friends and make sure there's like, you know, a margarita night on the calendar for that night. You know, go hang out with my friends or something. You know, whatever it is that helps you feel a little better. Um, the other thing is if you do have a mental illness... Um, I remember hearing things that I felt did not help me very much. So things that always made me feel worse about myself in the performing world were things like you need to have a thick skin because I didn't have a thick skin. My thought process was always inherently negative, so that didn't help. Um, you need to learn to take criticism. Um, part of the reason I had a hard time taking criticism was because it was hard for me to understand what was good criticism and what was criticism that my depression was telling me. Not that I knew that at the time, but my depressed voice can tell me that I'm a piece of crap like all the time. So I need to know what does that mean? Well, if you have specific criticism that you can address in your performing, take it and do something about it. But if somebody is giving you some general piece of criticism, like you're too ugly for this or whatever, no, you don't need to take that criticism, okay? If it's too general for you to do anything about, that's probably not criticism you need to worry about. That's my little tidbit of that to kind of help cope. <laughs> um, what else was probably not very helpful? Oh, that you have to be like working constantly singing every day, practicing all the time. You need to be like out there and have your binder of stuff for your auditions and go, 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 and spend every penny you have extra on your performance. That kind of mentality. Because that's all you can do to ever be successful. Now look, I wasn't the most successful performer, so maybe take it with a grain of salt. But when you have depression especially, um, since motivation is a big problem with that, I need to take time off sometimes. I gotta take like a week to just mentally be like, I'm not gonna worry about these things. You know what I mean? Sometimes at the end of a semester, I needed to take a week off of singing because I wasn't emotionally in a very good place to do it. I was dissociated, I was overly stressed, I was burnt out, I was numb. Had to take a break. 
you know? And in research is a similar thing. It happens in research too, where it's like, oh, you should always be reading and always writing and constantly reading articles and this and that. You know what? Sometimes I can't just keep plowing through articles. Sometimes if I'm getting a foggy brain and I'm feeling down and I can feel a bit of depressive thoughts kind of starting to sneak in there and become very prevalent, I need to take a break. Even if it's like an evening, even if it's just two days, I need to take a mental break from that. I can still get done the things that I absolutely 100% have to get done, like things that are on a deadline, you know? Like if you need to learn a role by a certain day, sure, keep doing things to help you learn that role. But, you know, you don't have to be sitting there working on everything under the sun all the time. Um, and it's interesting because I think also if you have a mental illness trouble, dealing with rejection and disappointment is mean something different to me than it does someone without depression and anxiety. Um, and I know this from being married to my husband. I mean, maybe this should have really been split up into two different posts, perhaps, but I'm just going to keep talking. Well, because I think I'm almost done. But <laughs> so my husband doesn't have these things. He doesn't have depression or anxiety. And it's amazing to me because if he has a disappointment, I think of it like me, right? I think, oh man, it's gonna be like all weekend, he's gonna have to deal with this, da da da. He processes it and he's done with it, like in a night. Like maybe just like a couple hours of venting is all he needs and then he feels fine. And it's amazing to me because essentially if you don't have mental illness, what it looks like to me is like he processes emotions the way like you know, freaking professional athletes do sports. Like, it's amazing, you know? It's like watching a gymnast just nail a landing. It's like, whoa, <laughs> you just processed it that fast? Oh my gosh. Whereas for me, it's more like, okay, all right, uh, okay, those thoughts are from the disappointment. Those are natural thoughts to have. Oh, nope, those are depressive thoughts. Those are not thoughts I'm gonna give a lot of weight to. I need to plan ways to essentially like kind of avoid the depressive thoughts because I don't want to give them power, you know? So it's like, I need to make sure I have a certain amount of stuff planned. Maybe I need to just really relax, do a little more me time, do a little whatever, a little self-care essentially to make sure that depressive thoughts don't become overwhelming just because I had some disappointment that was beyond my control. Um, and so if... If you find that having disappointments really takes the winds out of your sails for a long time, and I mean a long time, like at least a week, if you know you're going to feel like bad for a while about it, maybe go talk to somebody. I wish I would have done it <laughs> back in the day. But, um, you know, because learning about yourself, like learning how you need to handle disappointment in a healthy way. And it might mean you don't bounce back that fast. And it might mean you need to clear your calendar a little bit for some things, if you can. If it's in your power to take a little bit of a break, take like a week off of like constant practice or whatever. If that's, if you can do it, do it. If that's what you need to do. And that's what I mean by valuing your mental health is learning about yourself, you know, having professionals help you figure out what's in your power to change and what's not in your power to change. Thought processes that are part of your illness versus thought processes that are actually just part of life. Um, and focusing on the positive processes, the ones that you should be doing, the healthy way of processing emotion versus giving your illness all the power and the fuel. Because disappointment fuels depression. Like, I don't even know what. Holy cow. Depressive thoughts are like, ah, oh, yeah, we had a disappointment. We're going to think terrible about ourselves for a long time. And it becomes this big generalization of everything that's horrible about you as a person, whether it's true or not. It feels true and it sounds true. And so, you know, and you have that logical part of your brain that says, I think this is just depression. But then the depressive voice is like, shut up, logical brain. You're going to feel like crap because I tell you feel like crap, essentially. So, um, so that's what I would say is it's a really good idea, I think, to consider your mental health the same way you consider eating well, exercising, 
you know, physical health when it comes to stuff like that. Um, in the sense of getting help when you need it, going to professionals who know what they're doing, um, people with, you know, psychological associations, people with degrees, people with training, formal training in this stuff. And you might have to find, you might have to try a few counselors before you really find one you click with. Um, you know, and trying medication if you have to, um, which is its own thing. But what I find is medication helps me redirect my thoughts. It doesn't stop them, but it's, it redirects more. And if I, it doesn't stop anxiety attacks, but if I do have an anxiety attack, it's a lot shorter. It's only like 30 minutes before I'm able to kind of get myself out of it versus four to five hours, which was more common before I went on medication, having like an anxiety attack like all evening long. Um, and then also if I have depressive thoughts, I can redirect them. Or I can recognize them a lot faster. I can say, ah, that's a depressive thought. And it, does, it, it takes a lot for me to really like sink into really like, I want to just lay in bed all day kind of depressive thoughts. Um, now that I'm on medication, it's a lot less prevalent. So just want to hang out. Um, I didn't usually give into that feeling because like I said, I usually dissociated. I usually just went through the motions of my day. I would just get out of bed, drag myself out of bed and kind of go through my day like a zombie, like an emotional zombie. Um, <laughs> not feel not feeling good things, not feeling bad things, just, you know, just getting my stuff done. That was kind of how I rolled. And it's not the most enjoyable way to live. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's what I'm encouraging you guys. If you feel like you have a mental illness, get some help. Um, don't be afraid of getting help. And learn all you can about how you need to handle disappointment in your way, the time frame that you need to get over something. Um, if you find you're in toxic situations, knowing what you have the power to do and the decisions you have the power to make and then knowing how to prioritize. Um, if it's the situation you're going to be in a toxic situation for years, I would say it's not worth it personally. I don't think it's worth it at all because that's, that's, for me anyway, I would need so much more time to get over <laughs> all the trauma and self-doubt and all that awfulness that the toxic situation kind of instills in my brain. All of that lovely fuel, the depression, it gives the depression. Um, I have to kind of walk away from things that fuel depression because, you know, it, you know, in, 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 in typical professional settings, if people are being professional, it doesn't mean I don't get criticism. It means the criticism I get is intended to help me, not intended to harm. And I think that people don't quite understand that difference when it comes to tough love. There are people out there who, they think tough love is essentially emotionally beating you up. And that's that person's problem really you know, in a practical way, it's that person's emotional issues that lead them down that path of thinking, I'm going to be hypercritical of literally everything about you as a person and, and, and never tell you anything positive and never tell you what you do well. And I'm just going to give it to you in this tough love kind of way um, to try to build you up. No, you do have to know what you do well. Um, that's one of the critical parts of learning is knowing not just what you do badly, but also knowing what you bring to the table and what you're doing well so that you're not totally lost. Because if all you hear about is what you do is terrible, then you second guess little or everything you do. And then it, it sabotages what you are doing well because you think what you're doing well is also probably something you're screwing up. So then you just get paralyzed. You don't know what to do, right? So it's not a healthy environment to learn in if all you're getting is tough love in that I can be mean to you as, as mean as I want kind of a way. And it really is more that person's problem, but especially if, you ha if you're young and you're just not sure, or if you're like me and you have the depression, it can be really hard to recognize that it's really more that person than it is yourself, okay? And that people who really want to help you get better they give you criticism in the spirit of helping you learn and helping you grow to be your best. Those are the people you want to seek out. 
those are the people you want as mentors, those are the people you want as your support systems, um, and that means your teacher, your vocal coach, whoever it is, your mentor, you know, any mentor like that. Um, you want those people to be the ones you go to um, because they'll tell you what you do really well when you need to hear it, and they'll also tell you ways to help yourself that are practical, that are things you really can do, and, and, and advice you can apply, and things that really do make you better. Um, and that feels good, because that builds confidence. Just being told what you do badly, all the time, day in and day out, doesn't build much confidence, right? So if you're in those toxic relationships, I would say find new relationships, walk away. Do it politically, do it so that you don't burn bridges, hopefully, but heck, if you're being harassed, ugh, just get out in my opinion, but you know, everyone has to go through their own process. Um, but essentially, don't be afraid to seek help. Don't be afraid to seek help navigating those situations that you feel you need to leave. It's good to have somebody help you navigate that. Because when you're very emotionally tender, it's very hard to know how to navigate things politically. Um, but then also looking after your own mental health by knowing what's in your power to change, knowing how you need to go through a process when it comes to just natural disappointments that happen to occur in a highly competitive environment. You're going to have disappointments. So learn how you need to cope with them and learn how long you need to cope with them. Um, you know, maybe if you have depression, maybe you want to schedule counseling shortly after what might be a disappointment. Maybe you just want to make a deal with your counselor. You know, be like, can I give you like an online message or something to tell you like I need to see you now, <laughs> you know, or I need like a quick, a quick little like 10 minute come and tell you I was disappointed kind of thing or something or, or make some sort of game plan, you know what I mean? Um, all right. Hopefully someone out there finds this helpful. 40 minutes. Good Lord, it's long. I might split this up. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I probably should. But um, hopefully this is helpful for someone. Everybody, I wish you all the best of mental health. Um, if you want to hear anything else about this, please let me know. It's not my area of expertise, like I said, but I have a lot of hindsight about things that I would do differently if I was younger. So if you're young and you want that kind of advice, let me know.